Welcome to 2023 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Lesson 8 is titled Planning for Success and is read in preparation for teaching on Sabbath, February 25. Sabbath afternoon, February 18. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, your word is a guide to us each day. And as we open it this week and we read from Colossians chapter 3 about how you care for us in so many ways and that we can see you as Lord and we can receive the inheritance as we serve you. Lord, we pray that today your Holy Spirit will speak through my lips that not only will people understand, but that they will see the love and the grace that comes from you and how that trust can come from that and faith and the surety that one day Jesus will come and each of us will have a part in that eternal kingdom along with those that we love. And Lord, today I'd like to pray for our families. I'd like to pray for the families of those who are listening in Bonnells Bay in New South Wales and those who are listening in Talem Bend in South Australia and Albion in Queensland. And Lord, individuals who uh, have responded uh, to um, our podcasts of the reading of the lesson, Lord. Uh, I'd pray for them individually and for their families because each one of us has a prayer request. We've got Doreen in the Cayman Islands and Deborah in Trinidad and Tobago and Eileen in the Philippines and Alice in Kenya and Sandra in Massachusetts and Maggie and Charlotte in Jamaica and San Khan in the USA and Joel in the Philippines. Lord, wherever we are, we know that we can put our trust in you. And as we open your word, we just thank you that we can know that you will be with us as we study this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our memory text this week is Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Let's read that again, Colossians three twenty-three and 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Most people want to live a successful and happy life. Of course, in a fallen world where tragedy and calamity can strike at a moment's notice, this goal might not always be easy to attain. Then, too, there is the question of how we define success. There is the case of Joseph in Egypt. If there ever were a successful life, that certainly would be one, wouldn't it? from prison to palace, from that kind of thing. On the other hand, what about John the Baptist? He went from prison to the tomb. How successful was his life? Again, it all depends upon how you define successful. This week, we are going to look at the idea of success in the context of basic stewardship and financial principles. No matter who we are or where we live, money and finances are going to be a part of our life, whether we like it or not. What then are some steps, practical steps, that you can take along the way that, though not guaranteeing success, can nevertheless help us avoid common pitfalls and mistakes that can make financial success a bit more difficult? Sunday, February 19. First things first. Read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. What is the message there for us? Ecclesiastes 12, beginning at verse 1. Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. As youths mature into adulthood, thoughts will arise about having to provide for basic needs – food, clothing and shelter. 
Jesus himself has told us how to prioritize our needs when he said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you in Matthew 6.33. Of course, for those who are older and who didn't make a choice for Jesus when they were young, there is still time to make the right decisions regarding stewardship. As we saw in Genesis twenty eight, twenty to twenty two, Jacob had made some important life choices, both spiritual and financial. Let's have a look at that. Genesis twenty eight, beginning at verse twenty, then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. In the vision, the Lord introduced himself to Jacob as the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac in verse 13. Then, as part of his vow to God, Jacob said, The Lord shall be my God. Read Genesis chapter 29, verses 9 to 20. What is important about the timing of this event in the life of Jacob? Genesis 29, beginning at verse 9. Now while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel, and lifted up his voice, and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative, and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass, when Laban heard the report about Jacob his sister's son, that he ran to meet him, and embraced him, and kissed him, and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. After Jacob made his spiritual and financial commitments to God, the Lord directed him to Rachel at the well, as we read in chapter 29, 9-20. It is fitting to make your spiritual decision and your life work decision before committing to marriage. Your future spouse should know what they are getting into. Is this person a committed Christian? What type of work will he or she be involved in? Will this person be a teacher, a nurse, a lawyer, a labourer, whatever? What kind of life will I be committing to? Other questions that need answers before the marriage commitment are, what level of education has been completed? What amount of debt will come into the marriage? Am I willing to accept this situation as part of my responsibility? And so to finish the day, read Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Why is this principle so important to consider when looking for a life partner? Though it doesn't guarantee a good marriage, why would it help make the chances of a good marriage greater. (music) 
Monday, February 20, the blessing of work, ideally. Unless you were independently wealthy or the beneficiary of a trust fund that mummy and daddy set up for you so that you would never have to work a day in your life, if you read many stories about these kids, the money meant to be a blessing often leads to tragedy for them as adults. You will sooner or later need to work for a living. The ideal, of course, is to find something that you are passionate about that can provide you with a good income, get trained in it, find a job doing it, and work at it for your working years. That's the ideal, of course. It doesn't always turn out that way. Read Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, and also see Ecclesiastes 9, 10, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 8 to 10. What is the significance of the fact that even before the entrance of sin, Adam, and certainly Eve too, was given work. How might this explain why, as stated above, those who never had to work found their situation to be a curse? Genesis 2 and verse 15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, Whatever your hands find to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. And Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 8 to 10, Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labour and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. This work was not a punishment, obviously. It was designed for their good. That is, even in paradise, even in a world in which no sin, no death and no suffering existed, God knew that human beings needed to work. And to Adam, we read in Our High Calling, page 223, was given the work of caring for the garden. The Creator knew that Adam could not be happy without employment. The beauty of the garden delighted him, but this was not enough. He must have labour to call into exercise the wonderful organs of the body. Had happiness consisted in doing nothing, man, in his state of holy innocence, would have been left unemployed. But he who created man knew what would be for his happiness, and no sooner had he created him than he gave him his appointed work. The promise of future glory and the decree that man must toil for his daily bread come from the same throne. End of quote. However... Even after the fall, when, as with everything else, work had been tainted by sin, God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And that's from Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Notice, God cursed the ground for your sake, for the sake of Adam, with the idea that work would be something that he would need, especially as a fallen being. And so to finish the day, what is it about work that ideally should make it something that can be a blessing to us? Tuesday, February 21, The Earning Years As we've seen, God intended for humans to work in one capacity or another. This part of our life, the working years, is usually about 40 years long. For many people, this is the time when children are being brought up and educated, and when the home and other major purchases are acquired. This can be a very intense time financially. It is a very sensitive time because the family is learning to work together and its members are creating lifelong bonds. Financial stress can wreck the marriage at this point and frequently does. Families in which both parties have a Christian commitment and are willing to follow biblical principles are much more stable. 
Read 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, Proverbs 14.23 and Colossians 3.23-24. What important points can we take away from these texts about finances in the home? 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Proverbs 14.23, In all labour there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. And Colossians 3, beginning at verse 23, And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. In many cases, the husband is the main breadwinner, although... Often both spouses work. Of course, unexpected circumstances can arise, sickness, economic downturns, whatever, that make this ideal difficult. People need then to adjust accordingly. The children who are brought into the world during this segment of life are called a heritage from the Lord in Psalm 127 verse 3. We must remember that children bring with them an awesome responsibility. The goal of Christian parents is to train their children to become independent adults in this life and to fit them for the life to come. Here are three points to help parents. 1. Provide a Christian home environment. This would include regular and interesting family worship, regular Sabbath school and church attendance, and faithfulness in tithes and offerings. These are great habits to form in early life. 2. Teach children a willingness to work and an appreciation for it. Children will discover that diligence and integrity at work are always noticed, appreciated and rewarded. They will learn that money comes to us as a result of our giving time to others by performing tasks that are valuable to them. And three, help with a good education. Education is expensive today, particularly Christian private school education. But to parents with plans for their children, not only for this life, but also for that which is to come, it is well worth the cost. And so to finish today, of course, no matter what they do, no one has any guarantee about the direction their children will go. Why is it important for parents not to blame themselves for the wrong choices their older children might make? Wednesday, February 22. Working with Integrity. Another phase of a successful life, the last phase, has the potential to be the most enjoyable, if the decisions of the early years have been wise and not ruined by unexpected events. In an ideal situation, the parents have raised their children to become independent adults, the home is paid for, the transportation needs are met, there are no lingering debts, and there is a sufficient income stream to provide for the senior family's needs. God calls his children to a higher standard in work and life. That standard is God's law written in our hearts and reflected in our characters, as we read in Jeremiah 31 verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. As society erodes and Christian teaching is diluted and minimised, it will become even more important for the individual Christian to live and work on a level that is above reproach. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 verse 1, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favour rather than silver and gold. The Bible records instances of employers who recognised that they were blessed because of having a godly employee. When Jacob desired to leave his father-in-law Laban and return with his family to his homeland, Laban entreated him not to leave, saying, Please stay 
if I have found favour in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. That's Genesis 30, verse 27. And when Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt, his master Potiphar made a similar observation about Joseph's work and rewarded him accordingly. Read Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 to 5. Although the texts do not specifically tell us, what do you imagine Joseph had been doing that caused his master to look so favourably upon him? Genesis 39, beginning at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favour in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had put under his authority. So it was, from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So, in our work and financial management and whatever we do, we should do it all to the glory of God. He is the one who gives us the knowledge and strength to succeed in life. And then in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12, we read, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honour come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And so to finish the day, what are the principles that you are following, not just in work, but in life in general? What changes might you need to make? Thursday, February 23, Seeking Godly Counsel there are scores of secular money management gurus out there, but God warned us against consulting them for the management of the assets he has entrusted to us. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. That's from Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. So, the man who delights in the law of the Lord, the law here could be understood more broadly as the word of God, shall be blessed. How simple is that? And he will prosper, be successful. Read Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 8. How do we apply this principle in our basic financial matters? Proverbs 3, beginning at verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. An overview of the biblical counsel on financial management gives us very valuable points to follow. Let's look at seven of them. 1. Get organised. Develop a spending plan, as we read in Proverbs 27, verses 23 and 24. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. Many families just exist from paycheck to paycheck. Without a simple plan for earning, spending and saving, life is much more stressful. 2. 
Spend less than you earn. Determine to live within your means. Proverbs 15 verse 16 Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Many families in Western countries actually spend more than they earn. This is made possible only because of the availability of credit and debt. Many problems plague those who are in debt. 3. Save a portion from every pay period. We read about this in Proverbs 6 verses 6 to 8. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no captain, overseer or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. We save to make larger purchases in the future and to take care of unplanned expenses such as accidents or illness. Some savings can be used to plan for the time when, because of advancing age, we are no longer able to be employed. 4. Avoid debt like COVID-19. And we read about this in Proverbs 22 verse 7. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Interest is one expense you can live without. A person or a family living with debt, that is on borrowed money, is really living today on money they expect to earn in the future. If any life changes occur, then serious financial embarrassment can result. 5. Be a diligent worker. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Proverbs 13 verse 4. 6. Be financially faithful with God, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 to 14. And that reads, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way, and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses, and in all to which you set your hand, and... He will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow." and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath, if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. So you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or the left, to go after other gods to serve them. No family can afford to live without God's blessing. And number seven, remember that this earth is not our real home. Our management says a lot about where our ultimate priorities are, as we read in Matthew 25 verses 14 to 21. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. 
Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them, and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his lord's money. After a long time, the lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Friday, February 24. Ellen White writes in Education, page 145, No scheme of business or plan of life can be sound or complete that embraces only the brief years of this present life and makes no provision for the unending future. No man can lay up treasure in heaven without finding his life on earth thereby enriched and ennobled. End of quote. And from the same book, page 137, that which lies at the foundation of business integrity and of true success is the recognition of God's ownership. The creator of all things, he is the original proprietor. We are his stewards. All that we have is a trust from him to be used according to his direction. End of quote. Because of the pressure to provide for our families, many times we think that our work is simply to provide an income. But as Christians, we also face doing our part in the great commission that Jesus gave to all his followers. After quoting this commission as found in Mark 16.15, Ellen White wrote, well, look, before we read what she wrote, let's read that commission in Mark 16.15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now the quote, not all are called to be ministers or missionaries in the ordinary sense of the term, but All may be workers with him in giving the glad tidings to their fellow men. To all, great or small, learned or ignorant, old or young, the command is given. And that's from Education, page 264. And from the same book, page 267, we read, We need to follow more closely God's plan of life, to do our best in the work that lies nearest, to commit our ways to God, and to watch for the indications of his providence. These are rules that ensure safe guidance in the choice of an occupation. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, how do we as Christians define what a successful life is? What might the difference be between what the world defines as success and what we ideally should? Take, for instance, John the Baptist, How would you define his life, which ended ignobly in a prison, all based on the whim of an evil woman? Would you call it successful? What reasons can you give for your answer? And two, how do we explain the fact that there are many very successful people who follow none of the biblical principles about wealth management or life in general? Or what about those who try to follow them and nevertheless don't succeed? Perhaps they get sick or calamity strikes. How are we to understand these situations? And now it's time for our mission story for this week, read by my niece Sibylla, who, like me, is also a volunteer. Thank you, Sibylla. The Cat and the Coal Porter by Andrew McChesney 
young literature evangelist Simo Vekavuri stopped at a well-kept house near Turkuru, Finland's oldest city and former capital, in the middle of winter and showed his books to two unmarried sisters who lived there. To his surprise, the sisters quickly ordered a copy of every book. Then they left him standing alone in the living room. He did not dare leave. Finally, one of the sisters came downstairs with a big cat tucked under her arm. Mister, aren't you going to do anything to this cat? she asked. What should I do? Simo asked. Aren't you the vet whom we just called? she said. No, he said, I'm a literary evangelist. For years afterwards, the sisters told their friends with peals of laughter about how they had mistaken Simo for a vet and thought that they had to buy his books in order for him to treat their cat. The sisters kept the books. On another occasion, Simo went to a forest to eat lunch and pray on a Friday afternoon. Before this week ends, Jesus, give me an opportunity to witness for you, he prayed. After eating, he knocked on the door of a farmhouse. I'm selling this book, he said, holding out a copy of Ellen White's The Great Controversy to the woman who opened the door. I'm not at all interested in the book that you are selling, the woman replied, but I would like to hear what Jesus means to you. After Simo described his love for Jesus, the woman spoke. Let's go to the back room and pray on our knees together, she said. At that moment, her adult daughter came to the door. Join us, the woman told her daughter. Your knees need to be bent in prayer too. After praying, Simo prepared to leave. The woman followed him out the door. I'd like to order the book that you showed me, she said. It was then that Simo realised that the woman had an interest in spiritual matters. When a pastor started evangelistic meetings in the area some time later, Simo introduced him to the family. The pastor held Bible studies in the farmhouse and the family joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Today, the woman's granddaughter is an active church leader in Finland's capital, Helsinki. This mission story illustrates spiritual growth objective number five of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to disciple individuals and families into spirit-filled lives. Read more on IWillGo2020.org and read more about Simo next week. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful. And here is a disclaimer. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation.